Hey there, folks. Uh, I'm going to talk today about Captain Beefheart. I'm going to give a brief overview. And the reason I'm going to do this is because I was noticing the other day, you know, Captain Beefheart was not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Not that that matters. But if, I can't think of hardly anybody more original, unique, um, innovative, uh, influential than Captain Beefheart. He had uh, 13 albums he released over 17 years. I think a lot of times people only know him for one or two albums. You know, Trout Mask Replica, Safe as Milk maybe, and they don't really know the other albums. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of the albums in order that they were recorded, not necessarily that they were released. Because if you know anything about Beefheart, you know sometimes he recorded albums and uh, they wouldn't get released right away for whatever reason. And uh, then they'd be released several years later. So, you know, his discography is a little bit confusing. With different labels, different band members, different release dates. So I'm going to go through all of these in order. All right. I'm going to start off with a, a, a collection of songs that was released before he released an official album. 1966, the Captain B. Fart Band put out two singles on A&M Records. Okay. These were uh, produced by David Gates of Bread. And the first single they felt was Diddy Why Diddy. To live way down in Diddy Why Diddy. Now, there were a lot of, you know, white boy blues bands at the time. You know, you got your, you know, Stones, um, Animals, Yardbirds, right? And they were good. But there's something a little special about Captain Beefheart. It had some energy, had some, 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 uh, some edginess. Um, well, a lot of it had to do with the fact that Captain Beefheart could sing in a Howling Wolf type voice or Muddy Waters. He could do a lot of different voices. He had quite a range stylistically and octavely, whatever. You know, so he had a really great voice that he could do with blues that sounded quite authentic. And his band was very powerful, very strong players. And his band at the time were, it consisted of Doug Moon on guitar, Jerry Hanley on bass, Richard Hepner also on guitar. Alex St. Clair was on drums for, for most of this. And then they brought in P.G. Blakely on drums. So it was a powerful band. Anyhow, so that first single was Diddy Why Diddy, backed with a song written by uh, Captain Beefheart. The second single was Moonchild, which was written by David Gates. And I can actually hear Bread, uh, David Gates, in there a little bit. It's a good song. You know, bluesy, psychedelic type pop song. Uh, those two singles, as well as a fifth track, is, is on this CD here that came out in 84 or 86 uh, called The Legendary A&M Sessions. It's an EP, if you will. And, um, you know, it didn't come out back then. It was released later, so it's sort of a compilation later. So it's not really what I would consider an official album by Captain Beefheart, but I just wanted to mention it to you. After this time, A&M decided to drop Beefheart because these singles uh, did not sell that well. So they got rid of Beefheart, and when they did, Doug Moon left the band, and um, and also P.G. Blakely left the band. Now, they're signed to Buddha Records at this time, and when they are, they bring in Ry Cooter on guitar, and they bring in John French on drums, a guy who's going to be involved with Beefheart pretty much for the whole ride, okay, in a, back and forth. All right, and, then, and the first official album they released was Safe as Milk, which a lot of people know. It's a fantastic debut album. And a year of other fantastic debut albums, Velvet Underground, The Doors, just a great year for debuts. And this is one of them, Safe as Milk, fantastic album. Wonderful. I recommend it to pretty much anybody. Even if you don't like Captain Beefheart, I think you'd still like this one. It's just great. It's just a blend of Delta Blues music, uh, soul, R&B, doo-wop, uh, pop, avant-garde. Uh, his lyrics are quite poetic, so you get some of that. You know, if you like poetic lyrics, kind of surreal in some ways. Uh, superb performances by everyone in the band. Again, this is not just another, just another, you know, white boy blues band. These guys are quite, quite good. Powerful. Very inventive. They bring in some interesting instruments like the theremin. It's just a great, great album. Safe as Milk. Everyone should have that album. Fantastic. Okay. Now, after that one... Ry Cooter left the band. Interestingly enough, he went to form a band called Fusion, and they put out one album that I talked about on my uh, One Album Wonder video. And that album sounded a lot like Captain Beefheart, early Beefheart. But anyhow, when he left, they brought in Jeff Cotton, another great, great player, and a slide guitar and blues guitar player, really, really good. 
they went into the studio again and they were going to put out a double album record a double album and the name of the double album was supposed to be it comes to you in a plain brown wrapper the tracks for that double album are compiled on cd as the bonus tracks for safe as milk as well as the mirror man sessions cd that came out in 70 uh, 71 okay or this was actually came out in 1999 i should say the mirror man album came out in 1971 let me go back a little so they're in the studio in 1967 recording this music that's supposed to be on the double album it never quite was released at that time however a lot of the music they were recording were, were like um, there was supposed to be one album of long blues jams, psychedelic blues jams and four of those tracks were put on an album called mirror man again that was not released until later in 1971 and on that album, I really like it quite a bit. You've got some good songs on there, you know, like um, you're going to need somebody on your bond, uh, like uh, Tarot Plane, 25th Century Quaker, uh, Mirror Man, and then a song called Candy Corn, which is an excellent song, which is going to appear on this next official album I'm talking about. So Mirror Man did not come out after Safe as Milk. It wasn't the second album. Why are you talking about it? Because it, it contains material recorded after Safe as Milk. It's a very good album. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily to new listeners necessarily, uh, but it is quite good. I've, I enjoy listening to it all the time. I like hearing how all of the creativity. There's not a whole lot um, of variety uh, within the, the melodic components of the songs, but there's a lot of creativity in the expression and, and Don Van Vliet's voice. Uh, and it's in the, in the instruments and how they're trying to kind of work. It's all pretty much done live in the studio. And you can feel how they're trying to work with it. That was supposed to be one album of the double album set. Then the other album was supposed to be more, more regular songs type of thing. Anyhow, that didn't come out. So we're in, that won't come out now. So what we have now is we have the second official Captain Beefheart album, which is called Strictly Personal, which looks like it's in a brown, a plain brown wrapper. Uh, with some uh, stamps on it there. Now, I love this album. So what you have, if you basically have Safe as Milk and you have the, the Mirror Man Session CD, which came out in 1999, if you have these two, the bonus tracks from Safe as Milk combined with all the tracks from the Mirror Man Sessions will give you kind of like those Buddha sessions that they did at the time. But again, it was not released by Buddha. So what they did was they moved over to a record company called Blue Thumb in 1968. It was a record company uh, run by Dave, Bob Krasnow. And they released this album, which has some reworkings of some of the songs that they did on, you know, that they recorded in the Buddha sessions, like Candy Corn, um, Trust Us, and stuff like that. It's a really good album. It's uh, still very deeply into the Delta Blues, excellently performed. Typically powerful performances, really powerful, uh, with psychedelic effects throughout. Um, Bob Krasnow, for some reason, felt that he should be adding some psychedelic effects to the, to the tracks without the bands knowing about it, apparently. And that diminishes the album considerably, uh, unless you really like that kind of thing. I, mean, I happen to not mind it. It doesn't bother me that much. But yeah, the tracks are better without it, I think. But still, it's some great stuff. You've got Safe as Milk, which is, is a track that did not occur on the original Safe as Milk album. See, I told you this is getting confusing. Uh, Trust Us, uh, Beetle Bones and Smoking Stones. Talking about the Beatles and the Stones. That's a great album. Give me that hot boy. I Feel Like Acid, You know, Candy Corn. I love this album. No one ever talks about it much. You know, I think it's because of all of those psychedelic effects that were added, but it's really, really good. So I recommend that album also for fans of Safe as Milk. So what I say so far, as far as the first period of, of the Beefheart sessions, Beefheart recording output, Safe as Milk, Mirror Man, and Strictly Personal are right in that first period of Beefheart's output. Uh, the period with Delta Blues, R&B, Soul, Pop, with a sprinkling of experimental and avant-garde. So you got that early period there. And I, I think if you happen to like any one of those albums, you like the other of those albums. Good. Now, we're going to go into the next period now, which is the avant-garde period. 
we got some changes coming here. We got Alex St. Clair. He's he's le leaving the band, and he's being replaced by Bill Harkle Road, who's going to be a big player as well. Bassist Jerry Hanley left the band, and he's replaced by Gary Marker, also called Magic Marker, who uh, then was replaced by Mark Boston. So we have a lot of changes going on here, but then we end up with what's known as Trout Mask Replica, which is the album that you know he's very well known for. This is his his masterpiece, but by m m many many um, people, they believe this is his masterpiece. Double album. It was on Frank Zappa's Straight label, released uh, in 1969, but recorded in '68 and '69 in Woodland Hills in L.A. The famous story about how they were in the the house and they were starving and they. And uh, Beefheart treated him like a tyrant, or whatever. You can read the story, and you know, there's a great book uh, by Beefheart about Beefheart right here. That's fantastic. Written by Mike, Mike Barnes, called Captain Beefheart. It's really a great book to, to go through and talk about all of the different um, you know, recordings and what was going on all during that time. Very good biography. There's a book written by John French, but it's incredibly thick, very dense. And as big a beef heart fan as I am, I, I I couldn't get through it. I mean, I it was just I just couldn't get through it. But it is a good resource. I don't own it anymore. I just couldn't read it. So yeah, nothing against the book really. I mean, it was well done. It's just it was so detailed, so long. And it, you know, I recommend it to anybody who's a really big fan. Trout Mask Replica. Here we go. So we've got Don Van Vliet, known as Captain Beefheart, right? We've got Jeff Cart Cotton, known as Antenna Jimmy Siemens. He, everyone's given names here. Uh, Bill Harkle Rose, known as Zoothorn Rollo. That, he also put out a good book here, Zoothorn Rollo. It's called Lunar Notes. Zoothorn Rollo's Captain Beefheart Experience. That's a good book as well if you're interested. We have uh, John French, now known as Drumbo. We have Mark Boston, known as Rocket Morton. We have Captain Beefheart's cousin, Victor Hayden, who is known as the Mascara Snake. Absolutely fantastic, hilarious, innovative, beautiful album in many ways. I really think it is. It's the first album I ever heard of Captain Beefheart, and I'm sure many of you could say the same thing. we got blues here, R&B, avant-garde, free jazz. If you like free jazz, you'll like the components of this album. Spoken word, poetry, uh, experimental, surreal, garage rock, you name it. It's a stunningly innovative, original, virtuosic album. Got polyrhythms going on, different meters at the same time. Polyharmonies going on, different keys at the same time. You have fugal, like a fugue, uh, uh, playing between the two guitars. One guitar is playing a certain rhythm at a certain, um, you know, signature. And another one playing a different one at, on top of each other. Fantastic. It sounds like they're all just farting around, but it's very well done. Very, and of course, John French is is, is to be uh, congratulated for for helping bring out these ideas that Captain Beefheart had. Beefheart was not a, a trained musician, so he had to have people like John French help him out. This is uh, listed as number sixty on Rolling Stone's greatest five hundred albums of all time. It's my favorite of all of them, and I, I know all of them very well. But that's, that one's probably the one that still brings the smiles to my face more than the others, and uh, even as great as they all are. Fantastic. But no, not, it's not for everybody. It really is. If you've, if you've tried to listen to this album over and over and over again, and you say, I just can't, I can't get it, I don't like it, then that's great, that's fine. You might like the earlier material that I've just covered, or you might like some of the later stuff I'm about to cover. Okay, now... So we got that great album. Wonderful. Okay, now, after that album, we got some changes again. Jeff Cotton leaves the band. Jeff Cotton leaves the band. He goes over and joins forces with Merrill, uh, Merrill Frankhauser and joins a band called Mu. M-U, fantastic band. Put out a couple albums. Great. Uh, Art Tripp now, uh, Ed Marimba, they called him, joins the band at this point. He plays marimba and percussion on the next album. The next album released in 1970 and recorded in 1970, again on the straight label, was called Lick My Decals Off Baby. Really, really good stuff. Still got John French. And you know I see John French is there because one of the highlights on this album is the fantastic drumming, percussion. Powerful, powerful, innovative, tight, marvelous drumming. One thing you have on this album that you didn't have on Mask Replica is you only have one, one guitar. So you got Bill Harkeroy, that's all you got. Bill Harkle wrote on guitar, Zoothorn Rolo, 
That's, he's the only guy who's playing on guitar. And so you ha it's a little bit more of a leaner sound. You don't have the fugal playing between the two guitars like you had before. But you've got the avant-garde and experimental elements, the free jazz, uh, marimba uh, that you had in some ways that are more tr more crazy, in my opinion, than even Trial Mask Replica. Uh, there's times I think Trial Mask Replica seems more accessible to me than, than some of the stuff on, um, you know, Lick My Decals Off. It was reportedly Don Van Vliet's favorite of his albums. And I, I've heard a lot of people say they like this album better uh, than um, Trial Mask Replica. And I can understand that. I mean, it's, it seems sometimes to be a little more, a little more tight, maybe, you know, maybe a little more polished. But it's still got that biting, experimental, avant-garde, free jazz components. It's still, these two albums are are brutal. These two albums are brutal albums. Fantastic, brutal, class, uh, Captain Beefheart, fr frantic, you know, just amazing albums. But it's of that time, and if you don't like that. Don't think that you won't like any of, the, uh, of his albums. That's, that just means you don't like that style. That's okay. Now, we're going to enter into the next phase now, the third phase, if you will. We're going to slow things down a little bit, clean things up a little bit, bring back some of the more blues, R&B, funk, and soul, and pop. So this, this phase is going to last us from 71 to 72. The first phase uh was from 67 to 68 that's where we had the blues and the doo-wop and the pop and the you know, soul and all that the second period the avant-garde period was 69 or maybe 68 to 70 and then this third period is going to be 71 to 72 and the first album that's released on this one is on the reprise album reprise records uh recorded in 1971 and released in 1972 and it's called the spotlight kid okay now, uh, we've got a second guitarist brought in here on one track, Elliot Ingber. He's known as Winged Eel, Winged Eel Fingerling. <laughs> it's goofy. And you've got French, Harkle Road, Trip, and a drummer, uh, Reese Clark, uh, plays French horn on one track as well. I love this CD. I, I mean, this album. I think it's fantastic. It's more accessible, almost almost commercial in some some places. Uh, with blues not nearly as frantic as intense as you have on the previous two albums, uh, slower tempi, you know, slower speeds, uh, simpler somewhat music and arrangements a little bit. Uh, some of the band members didn't like the album. They, uh, John French thought it was boring, but I think it's an excellent album. A lot of very accessible, and groovy and funky music. Uh, the marimba gives us somewhat of a Zappa feel in places. Uh, the, the guitar instrumental, Alice in Blunderland, sounds like Zappa. If you were listening to that, you think it was Frank Zappa. But that was the album that came out next, and I happen to think it was very, very good. Spotlight Kid. You notice it only says Captain Beefheart. It doesn't mention the Magic Band on the cover. First time that happened. I think it's the only time. <clears throat> All right, now, after this album... John French leaves the band. He didn't enjoy doing this type of music. Apparently, it was too boring to him compared to the first two uh, compared to the previous two albums. Uh, Art Trip takes over on drums. He's still a great drum player. Ed Marimba, Art Art Trip. We bring in Roy Estrada uh, on bass, and uh, that allows Mark Boston to play some guitar as well as bass for this next album. And the next album is called Clear Spot. Now, Clear Spot is, and again, it's on Reprise Records, recorded and released in 1972. This album, a lot of people really like this album. Why? Because it's, it, well, it was produced by Ted Templeman. Ted Templeman, at this point in time, had produced Doobie Brothers. Uh, he had produced two outs, uh, Carly Simon, I believe, Van Morrison. He had, he had put out some really mainstream albums that sounded great. Very, very good, tight sounds. He was brought in to produce this album, and you can hear it. Definitely much, much more commercial-sounding album than what anything he'd ever done up to this point. Uh, still top-notch music, though. All of it's really, really good. Very funky, soulful, bluesy, rocking. Some songs could have easily been hits, pop hits, no doubt about it. Definitely recommended for fans who like their beef heart to be soulful and very listenable. Not too thorny, not too edgy. Good quality stuff. What's nice about this is that Clear Spot is on the same CD as Spotlight Kid. You get both of these two albums on one CD, and they're both from that, that, that four, third period, I, I call it, 
of Captain Beefheart's output where it's, you're getting kind of groovy, man. Soulful, funky, bluesy. And so I definitely recommend those two albums and this CD, the double CD, to people who like, you know, that early Beefheart. Uh, people that like uh, kind of soul, R&B type music, funk, definitely would like that, those, that CD, I think. Okay? Now, after that, after Clear Spot, Roy Estrada leaves the band. Alex St. Clair returns to add some guitar to help out Harkle Road for the next album. Now, we're going to be entering into the fourth phase, or fourth period of Beefheart, uh, the commercial phase. Now, yes, Clear, Clear Spot had some commercial components, but it wasn't self-conscious. It wasn't commercial. Uh, it didn't feel forced. It felt organic. It felt real. We're going to get into stuff here now that just feels like, what the hell? All right. And this next album that comes out is going to be on the Mercury in U.S. and Virgin in the United, uh, United Kingdom. The album is called Unconditionally Guaranteed which is by far the worst album by, for Captain Beefheart, as far as I'm concerned. It's by far the worst. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to people because of the fact that some of the songs are uh, almost um, embarrassing, in my opinion. Even Beefheart, he, he suggested people send this back for a refund. He said it's horrible. He didn't like it either. The band didn't like it either. After this album, the entire band quit. They all left him. They said, hell with this. We're not doing this anymore. Uh, some of the there's some decent tracks on it. Don't get me wrong. There are some good tracks on the album, but there's a lot of bubblegumish type pop almost, uh, very middle of the road in a bad way. Uh, just not very good at all. Very well performed. I mean, he's a good musician, but yeah, it failed. Tried to be you know you can see by the cover there. Here he is uh, with two fistfuls of uh, dollar bills in his hand. It's obviously he's saying, hey, I'm gonna make some money here. The band was tired of starving. Uh, they were tired of not making any money, you know, and they, he just tried to say, hey, let's do it. Let's make some money. You know, didn't work out. I think it's the only bad Captain Beefheart album, the only one. So the band leaves now. They all said to heck with it. Um, Harkle Road, Boston, and Tripp join a band called Mallard at this time. Put out some albums, all right? So the next album came out in 1974, just like uh, Unconditionally Guaranteed did. So in that one year, he puts out two albums that are in the commercial vein, Blue Jeans and Moonbeams. Both of these albums, by the way, are produced by a guy named DiMartino, Andy DiMartino. Now, I happen to think Blue Jeans, um, Blue Jeans and Moonbeams to be much, much, much great, better than Unconditionally Guaranteed. I think it's a, a good album. It doesn't sound like Beefheart. No, no, it's different, but it, it's still a good album. I really do think it's good. Most people hate it, but I, well, Kate Bush puts it in her top 10 albums, or at one time she did. Well, that says something, right? <laughs> Maybe not. You know, some really decent, even good tracks here. It's just not what you expect from him. So there you have it, you know. Captain Beefheart hated it. He said, uh, take it take it back, get your money back. These, these two albums, he thought, you know, eh, forget this, you know, bad, bad stuff. So anyhow, that's the next phase. Now, we got some changes now. Uh... In 1975, Beefheart went to collaborate with, uh, with uh, what's his name, Frank, <laughs> Frank Zappa on a, an, a live album, well, mostly live, album called Bongo Fury in 1975. Now, we're going to skip to 76 now. John French and a fellow named Jeff Morris Tepper, excellent guitar player, joins the new, the new Magic Band. Also, Denny Wally comes in on guitar and John Thomas on keyboards. And they put out an album, or they didn't put it out. They recorded an album for Discreet Records, which was co-founded by Frank Zappa and Herb Cohen. Bat Chain Puller, 1976. Fantastic album. It brings back a lot of the edgy, experimental, and innovative, and aggressive music of Beef Heart's past. So we're entering a new phase, sort of a return to, to the edgier Beef Heart. Uh, we've got uh, pop, we've got rock, we've got uh, great poetic lyrics, uh, we've got some free jazz, some avant-garde, we've got some experimental elements, you know. It was great to have John French back. You could tell he's back. He sounds fantastic on drums. It's an actually a quite accessible album, even though it has all that interesting, uh, innovative music. Unfortunately, as many of you may know, this album was mired in the legal battles between Zappa and Cohen. And because of the legal, Zappa, legal battles, 
these tracks were held ransom for many years and were not released. Now, some of the music from this was reworked, reinvented, redone for successive albums, which we'll get to. But this thing was held for a long time. It was not released until finally 2012 on the Zappa label. You have to go to the website, the Frank Zappa website, and you can order it from there. All right. Anyhow, so now after that recording, which is fantastic, John French leaves again. Denny Wally leaves. John Thomas leaves. Basically, the band leaves. You still have uh, you still have um, uh, Jeff Morris Tepper, good guitar player. He's still around. We bring in Eric Feldman on keyboards and all. We bring in Bruce Fowler on uh, on trombone. Uh, Robert Arthur Williams on drums. Uh, Richard Redis uh, on the guitar and Art Trip. So we're bringing some other people and we put out another album here, which is made up somewhat of songs from the Bat Chain Pooler, and it's called Shiny Beast, and in parentheses you'll see it says Bat Chain Pooler, so this is the official release of this stuff, although basically a different band than what you had before. I happen to love this album, I think it's an absolutely fantastic album. They used five tracks, four that were re-recorded uh, from the 1976 Bat Chain Pooler, this came out in 1978 on Warner, Warner Brothers, okay? Um, again, it has the aggressive, the edgy, experimental sound of B-Part. B-Part is really good. You have some trombone by Bruce Fowler that gives it a bit of a jazzy feel as well. It's a very accessible, very interesting, somewhat goofy at times album. It sounds a little bit thinner, uh, just a tad bit thinner maybe, uh, than the, the original Bat Chain Pooler tracks. A little bit. Uh, but still, it's a superbly produced, wonderfully produced album. Highly recommended to just about anybody who likes Captain B. Part at all. I re recommend that album. Okay. Now, after that album, Richard Redus leaves, leaves the band. Uh, John French rejoins the band again. See, he comes in and out. He's going to rejoin the band. He's going to play guitar, bass, and drums, and marimba for this next album. We got Gary Lucas, uh, a fan of Captain B. Part, that actually joined the band. He comes in and plays some guitar and French horn on the next album. And we're going to enter in what I consider the last phase of uh, Captain Beefheart, a phase of uh, basically wrapping up old ideas. Um, kind of, you, you get the feel that things are starting to wrap up a little, but they're still fantastic albums. Uh, these are from the 80s. So in 1980, we record uh, Dock at the Radar Station and release it on Virgin Records in 1980. It's the same lineup on, as we had for Shiny Beast, except for the addition of John French, even though Robert Arthur Williams is still a drummer as well, uh, and Gary Lucas. About half of the album is based on old ideas, including a few so songs from the 1976 Bat Chain Pooler uh, uh, sessions that were reworked and reinvented. They couldn't use those, those actual tapes. Uh, Zappa would not allow them to use them. Okay? Uh, we got some funky music here, uh, rocking, very rocking, hard-hitting album. It really is powerful. Jazzy, uh, surreal poetry, uh, a couple of instrumentals in there, guitar instrumentals and other things, uh, avant-garde, experimental, very energetic, powerful album. Dock at the Radar Station, highly, definitely recommended. After that, more changes. John French leaves the band now, okay? as does Robert Arthur Williams. So we bring in Cliff Martinez on drums now, and another guy, Richard Snyder. He, they call him Mid Midnight Hat Size. Richard Midnight Hat Size Snyder comes in on bass and marimba and viola. And the last album, the final album by my, Captain B. Fart is, is recorded and released in 1982 on Virgin and Epic Records, Ice Cream for Crow. We have a few songs here from Pat Jane, Bat Jane Puller were reworked for the album. Uh, what 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 uh, Van Vliet wanted, Captain Beefheart, what he wanted for this album was to take those old 1976 Bat Chain Puller tapes, which he obviously liked, and he rightly so, and he wanted to have access to them so he could put them on this final CD, this final album, but Zappa wouldn't let him go. You know, I mean, yeah, there's, there's money involved. Anyhow, so what he had to do was rework some of them, Okay, and uh, composed new material, and uh, it's a very good album. The recording seems to me a tiny bit thin, uh, lacking, I shouldn't say thin, a bit flat dynamically compared to Dock at the Radar Station. Dock at the Radar Station is really powerful, and this one is really good too, but it's not quite as, it's, 
it feels a little bit like what it is, like a, a last last statement. Uh, what we have here is um, a lot of poetry. Some of some of the tracks have uh, Beefheart reciting his poetry, basically over the music, which is great. I love his poetry. I think it's fantastic. Um, some uh, instrumental guitar tracks, and uh, I think it's I think it's a very good album. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to go through almost all of these albums individually and re and comment about them because they they deserve a video all their own. Again, this ended up being the last musical project for Beefheart. Uh, he stopped. He said, we're done. Uh, the band that was on this album did not even go and tour, uh, perform these songs anywhere. They, it was over. And so what you have then, folks, is you have this great period, a great a period of music for, for performance by Captain B. Farr, who deserves richly to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Big time. Big time. You've got that early period, folks. The early, early period with the blues and the, and the doo-wop and the soul and the R&B. Safe as milk. Mirror Man, and Strictly Personal. Great period. Then you get the avant-garde period. That's where you have Trout Mask and Lick My Decals Off Baby. Then you get a period where you're looking at kind of a returns to some of the bluesy elements, but still a lot of experimental, and that would be Spotlight Kid and, uh, you know, Clear Spot. Then you get the you know, intentionally trying to be commercial period with unconditionally guaranteed, which is pretty bad. And the much better, I think, um, Blue Jeans and Moonbeams. Then you get a couple of albums where we bring back some of the edgier experimental components, uh, Bat Chain Puller and Shiny Beast Bat Chain Puller. Both of these are well worth having, both of them, okay? And then finally, towards the end, we're getting the wrapping up taking old ideas, reworking them, coming up, basically trying to come up with some good stuff to wrap things up. This is a better album of the two, but they're both very, very good. There you have it, folks. Captain Beefheart, 17 years, 13 albums. The only one that I don't think is worth having, really, I think is unconditionally guaranteed, but even that's got some decent tracks on it. Okay, I'll talk to you guys later. I hope to, if I'm fortunate enough, to continue waking up and being vertical. <laughs> I hope to review some of these albums, if not most of them, down the road as we go. Love Captain Beefheart. Rich, rich music. Rewards repeated listenings. It's dynamic. They're living documents. Definitely, definitely worth honoring in a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame without any shadow of a doubt. All right, take care, folks. Bye-bye.